Well, this program is Cooking in Texas, a discussion about Texas food and cuisine. So if you thought you were coming to a lecture about quantum physics, wrong place. If you were supposed to be with the University Regents, law school. This is really a much better program. So welcome to Bennett Auditorium in the Draper Academic Building. And I'm John Wilson and director of the Texas Collection. And the Texas Collection is right next door in the Carroll Library. Food. Should be a great smile from you. Food. It is a passion, an obsession, and even an addiction for some. It is an integral part of every country's culture from Italy to India to Indonesia. People take great pride in growing the best ingredients and preparing the most delicious tasting dishes. And the food we eat can be sweet, salty, sour, bitter, pungent, and astringent. And the experts say to have a great meal that's satisfying you should have every one of those tastes every time you eat. That doesn't normally happen, does it? I'm guessing so many of you are here today because food is an important part of your life. Let's admit it. We all need to eat to live. But what we eat and how we prepare these meals is the fascinating part of today's discussion. Now, in Texas, we are blessed to have so many ethnic influences of our food culture. To name a few, there's the Spanish, the Mexican, the German, the Czech, the Norwegian. I think you're getting that we're diverse. French, and more recently, Chinese and Thai. One of the reasons I wanted to host this event was to make you aware of our 4,000 plus volume cookbook collection at the Texas Collection. Everyone in this room is welcome to use it, whether you're from Waco, Austin, or Dallas, it makes no difference to us. The second reason was to truly begin a food dialogue in Waco. Now, our moderator for today's panel is Addie Broyles. Addie, you want to raise your hand? Okay. And our panelists are Lisa Fain, Mary Margaret Pack, Marvin Benderly, and Beth White. And you can read more, to, more about them in the handout that you received when you came in. Now, hopefully, you decided to fill out a question card. And if you want to ask a question, pass the card to the end of the aisle. And there will be an opportunity at the very end. So please help me welcome Addie to the podium and all of our other panelists and thank them for coming to Waco. Can you guys hear me? Yep. No. Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> Press and hold. There we go. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. It's such a pleasure to see you all. Um, such nice faces from across the room. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about the Texas. We've already learned about the Texas collection because we got a private tour of the cookbook stacks. Um, and I'm excited about this conversation we're going to have up here and, and eventually to include you all in it. I'm really curious to know what you want to hear our panelists speak about. I know I have lots of questions for them. And um, my first one is just sort of a general question for all of you about when did you as an individual start getting interested in cooking? And then when did that interest grow into a, a subject of academic pursuit? Or more thoughtful pursuit, we'll say. We're passing the mic. Oh, oh we have several. Oh. Why don't you do that one? I'll give this one. All right. Um, I guess because I've just always cooked. I grew up cooking, and we never ate out, so we learned to cook at home. And um, Texas food really, was, Texas thinking of the ethnic groups was not a part of our diet. It was meat and potatoes, good German background, and that was it. So I guess um, I just grew up cooking. And when was your first meal that, that you prepared? Oh, that I prepared. Mm. I mean, were you a six-year-old in the kitchen? No, 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 no. But I probably learned to first bake. Mm -hmm. 
because my, oh, I had one grandmother that was a really good baker. Mm -hmm. So I did cakes and pies a lot. Mm -hmm. After, I don't remember whole meals so much. And at what point did you self-identify as a cookbook collector? Oh, they just sort of like rabbits. They just started growing. <laughs> <laughs> you gather a few here and a few there. And then when I started collecting, just as I realized, oh, I will have a collection, then eBay started. <laughs> That's it was addicting. It was addicting. <laughs> Lisa, when did you first uh, put your boots on in the kitchen? Um... Well, I, I, I'm a seventh generation Texan and I come from a farming family. So actually, I'm like the second generation that doesn't farm. You know, my grandparents grew up on farms. And so for us, and the farms were, they're still in the family. And so when I would grow, I was growing up in Dallas, you know, we'd go to the country every weekend and pick things and, you know, shell peas and things like that. So uh, food was always, and, and how it came from the ground and from animals and things like that. That was always just part of my upbringing. So it was always very central it was very, you know, it was always very important to me, I guess. But I didn't think it was special, and I didn't think Texas food was all that special. It was just what you ate. Until my uh, junior year in college, I went to Spain, and it was the first time where, you know, I couldn't get Tex-Mex, and a tortilla there is an egg dish, and, and things like that. And so my fellow Texans and I uh, started becoming obsessed with, you know, cooking Texas food. And then um, I have a blog called Homesick Texan. I've written a couple of cookbooks, and... When I became an adult and left Texas to move to New York, that obsession continued. So I guess that was when, that was my moment of Texas food is unique and different and you don't find it everywhere. And, and at that point, that was when I started collecting Texas cookbooks and, and actually, actually getting interested in my family's culinary history, you know, getting their recipe cards, talking to my grandma and, you know, writing down, you know, how things were made and, and about her childhood growing up on a farm and, you know, all the things that make Texas food special. I guess it was leaving Texas that was my defining moment. When did, uh, yeah, tell us, Marvin. <laughs> Well, um, I think I started getting interested in cooking when I realized that uh, nobody was going to cook for me anymore, and <laughs> I was too broke to go out to eat. So my, probably my first dish was macaroni and cheese or something like that. Um, and to this day, I'm still not a very good cook, and I'm not necessarily obsessed with the act, the act of cooking. Um, but I came to this spot uh, through my interest in history and getting at people's histories through food and through what they're eating and the conversations they have around the table. Um, and that started when I uh, became a member of the American Studies Department at UT as a grad student and started getting involved with uh, people like Elizabeth Engelhart, <clears throat> who's from North Carolina and uh, was a professor at UT at that time, and, and people involved with the Southern Foodways Alliance in uh, uh, Oxford, Mississippi. And uh, we did a book uh, as grad students called The Republic of Barbecue, and the idea was to go around two hours outside of Austin and interview not just pit masters or restaurant owners, but uh, people who were cutting wood and bringing it to uh, the restaurants, um, people building pits. And the idea was to collect all these, write about them a little bit, and get an idea, a broad idea of barbecue culture in Central Texas. So through Food Waste Texas, we do something similar. We don't write books, but uh, we go around the state collecting oral histories. So um, my interest is that historian focus, really trying to get, out, get at somebody's history, not just about what they're cooking, but really where they came from and, and what, it's, what, what they're cooking or eating says about them. Um, and uh, actually getting out and interviewing people for these oral histories is one of my favorite things to do, just connecting. I'm from a rural area, so... You know, I've, I've been in some of these conversations where uh, just get tears in your eyes. <laughs> you, you have that connection with somebody, and you may not really have anything in common except you ate the same thing, and you have uh, memories about that that you can talk about. So that's It's amazing how emotional food can make us. Yes, it really does. I think we've all probably shared moments like that. Mary Margaret, tell us about your first dish you made. Well, I think the first dish I made was... Um, tuna noodle casserole with potato <laughs> chips on top. <laughs> um, Which no one in this room would turn down. I would eat it today. Uh, I grew up with good southern cooks in my family, but I just kind of took food for granted. It was just there. Um, I realized I ate good food, but I didn't really appreciate it much at the time. 
and then I was probably in my 30s before I realized that I was interested in cooking. Um, the zeitgeist was a little different in the early 70s, and when young women had the opportunity to get an education, go to college, um, professions were opening up that for women that had not been open before, the last thing any of us were thinking about was spending time in the kitchen. So I, I had to work for 10 or 15 years before I realized how much I did enjoy cooking and more importantly than that, even feeding people. Um, so I started cooking on the side. I still had my day job, but I was doing parties and dinners for friends. And then when I was 45, I ran away to culinary school in San Francisco. <laughs> and I've never looked back. That's a dream. Um, so talk about what it was like leaving the South. How did that change your perspective on, on Texas foodways? And I mean, California foodways at the time, that was the center of the universe. And now, it, in some ways, it feels like Texas is the center of the food universe. Well, I will tell you that in San Francisco today, the hottest thing going is Southern cooking. Um, seriously, the new restaurants that are opening are uh, biscuits, catfish, um, things we all grew up eating. And to them, it's an exotic new cuisine, and they just think it's wonderful. Um, so it was a real opportunity for me to be exposed to some cuisines that I wasn't that familiar with, um, various Asian cuisines. Uh, and California cooking is its own world. So it, it was a real educational process for me, but it certainly made me pre appreciate what we had going here. I'm sure Lisa had a similar experience in New York. Yeah, Southern food. Yeah, Southern food is, is still really, really popular. I think Texas food, though, is going to be the next big thing. I mean, I'm not saying that jokingly. I mean, there's like, there's like high-end chefs who are opening up. There's like Ford Fry in Atlanta who's just opened up a Texas restaurant, and he's a Houstonian. And um, there's uh, Bar Ama in Los Angeles who's, I, I don't remember the chef's name, but, you know, he's a high-end chef, and he's, you know, paying his homage to his home. So kind of like southern food has, you know, Texas food is now the new thing. Well, here's the big question. What is Texas food? Because I think every one of us would define it in a different way based on our experience in this state. I'm originally from Missouri, and to ask that, people ask me, well, what is Missouri food like? And I kind of have a hard time answering that question because I grew up in a time when my, both parents were working. You know, we had a little grocery store in town that didn't always carry limes. And I ate a lot of uh, shake and bake pork chops and, um, you know, steamed broccoli and, and casseroles. And I mean, those are the, so those are the foods that I wax on nostalgically about for, for my youth. Um, and then I come here and, and hear about all these other food traditions. So can each of you talk a little bit about what you think are some of the iconic dishes, both expected and unexpected, that help tell the story of Texas food? Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> I'll just talk about one and then if we can come back to other ones if I... Well, I mean, yeah, well, what I'm kind of setting you up for is that not everybody's going to say chicken fried steak, no. even though... That's yeah. Lisa, I think, do you still have a Google alert set up for chicken fried steak? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, because you were saying, like, uh, what, you know, like I'm interested in what Chris Shepard is doing in Houston right. with Underbelly. He's, he's presenting Texas food in a way that is very different than a barbecue restaurant or a chicken fried steak restaurant. So can you talk a little bit about some of the unexpected things we might not assume? Well, yeah, let me, let me say one thing first, um, that people outside of Texas have a completely different idea of what we eat than what we do. Um, so for instance, we do, uh, you know, part of, part of Food Waste Texas is we do oral history projects, and we usually base them on a cuisine typically because it's easier to do, but there's so much diversity just in those projects. But, so we have a barbecue archive, we have a Tex-Mex archive, um, but the barbecue thing is interesting because uh, we partnered with a Texas A&M a few years ago to start doing barbecue camps, and they were doing them for a ridiculous amount of money. Um, and when, when we first got involved, I thought, we have to, there's no way we can do it for that. But it's incredible, the uh, outside of Texas interest in cooking brisket, for instance. And, in, and I'm sure Lisa can talk about that in, in New York. It's crazy. Um, we had this year, first off, it's, the ticket sold out in f under five minutes. And um, we had people from Kazakhstan, Canada, England, all over the United States. Um, we had, I have... <clears throat> inquiries from France. 
I mean, it, people are interested in that, because that's their idea of what, that, that's the only thing we do. But if you talk about Texas barbecue, you can't just talk about brisket. Um, and that's what happens with uh, our oral history projects, is you see all these different diverse ways of doing, or conceiving of that word. Um, and I, I, I can go way, I can go down a complete <laughs> rabbit hole here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and we can come back. But, uh, Marvin's, Texas and you can Marvin's <laughs> working on his dissertation right now. Yes. <laughs> um, can we, Mary Margaret, do you want to talk a little bit about some of your research that you've done, especially along the Gulf Coast, about how, what some of those foodways look like? Well I, well, I think the one idea that's most important in when you think about Texas food is that um, this state has been a crossroads culturally and geographically since the Native Americans were here. They were nomads and they had connections from Arizona to uh, Florida and there were trade routes. So even before Europeans arrived, foods were coming from all those directions, from deep in Mexico, uh, tri they traded with tribes there um, and up the Mississippi River Valley. So that's just a tradition that has continued in this state with the various um, waves of people who have come here. After Native Americans, the first ones were Spaniards through Mexico, bringing stuff from Spain um, and that part of Europe. Well, and the, well, I didn't want to interrupt you, but the, I mean, if the first European that traipsed across Texas was Cabeza de Vaca, right? And, and he was doing that. I mean, he was moving from place to place, eating different foods, and then continued on all the way to the West Coast and then back down to Mexico City. So sorry. That's but okay. That, you're right. I mean, it's a crossroads. And, and, I, and I just wanted to mention that when we all think about where our people came from and the food traditions that they brought, uh, besides Mexico, there were, were both Anglos and African Americans from the Deep South who brought their cooking traditions. Uh, there was uh, ranch cooking. Um, there were settlers from the Midwest. Uh, some of the earliest Anglo settlers came from the northern part of the South with their Scottish-Irish cooking traditions. And I think the to me, the coolest part about Texas food is that all of these influences are still here. We still take what we like from all these cuisines and, and sometimes it's traditional and sometimes we morph it into something new, but uh, I just love it that all these traditions come together right here where we are. And then we have all these festivals that still exist to uh, celebrate each of these individual things. I'm thinking about you know the kolaches or the um, you know, all the chili cook-offs, I mean, and the passion that people compete <laughs> when they go uh, out to Trilingua and everywhere in between to throw a bowl of red in, in a pot, so, and then don't even, uh, as, an, as a, well, I guess you'd call me a northerner, I do eat beans in my chili, and boy, I catch hell every time I write about that in the paper. <laughs> this, this happened just this week. Um, so, Beth, talk to me about how cookbooks are kind of a portal into this past and he can help us understand a little bit more about how we've gotten to where we are now? Well, the cookbooks that I collected were the ones that are really interesting, say, before World War II. They're really a portrait of the co community. Um, there's an interesting cookbook from East Texas, and there's a whole page in that cookbook, big black letters. This town's name, the blackest land, the whitest people. Ooh, you know what that community was like, early 20th century. Um, there's other cookbooks that have advertisements, and the advertisements for an early J young Jewish woman's sewing circle cookbook. The advertisements are for bacon and ham. <laughs> <laughs> there are, and so uh, as a historian, I mean, why, why? would that appear that way? That's certainly, and many of the recipes are not kosher foods. Uh, I, that's just a question for someone to... Uh, yeah, I have about. found that when I start digging into cookbooks, I have more questions than I do answers. <laughs> and, um, and especially the community cookbooks. So maybe this is a good pivot into community cookbooks. Uh, how many of you grew up with a good old spiral browned community cookbook somewhere in your house? Yay, I know, it's so neat. Um, and so I don't know who wants to take this question first, but 
why are community cookbooks still so important and relevant? Well, is it on? Okay. Well, I, I know growing up, uh, I have community cookbooks that come from my communities. Uh, I have a couple of family cookbooks, our church cookbooks, my grandma's church cookbooks, elementary school cookbooks. And I think when the community gets together to compile recipes, it's just, well, there's a prideful moment because you see your name in something and, and some, you know, your favorite dish. And so people are very proud. Oh, look, what, look what I'm sharing with you. And it just, you know, it's, it's a fun project to work on. Everyone loves food. And um, I don't know. I, I just think, I think it's just... Uh, I mean, so what? Uh, so I uh, helped put together a cookbook last year called the Austin Food Blogger Alliance Cookbook, and this was our attempt. At, we have an alliance in Austin of about 170 food bloggers. It's a unique organization aimed to basically set an, set an ethical standard for bloggers in the community, and also provide an opportunity for us to give back to the to to our city. Um, but as a person who had started thinking about the importance of of tracking history and and being of being a living historian that it would be a good idea for us to t capture Austin, a slice of Austin, in 2012-2013 through our recipes. Because that's exactly what these community cookbooks have, have done, even though the people who are putting them together might not have realized that they were creating historical documents that in 100 years, academics would be using to analyze how manufacturing was changing and how advertising was changing. I mean, it's so interesting to go into these cookbooks and see uh, brand names, uh, you know, just because the brand loyalty was there from for the consumers. So when people were asking, well, what, what recipes should I submit? Should I, you know, should submit queso and breakfast tacos because we're in Austin? And I said, no, I want I want a recipe from you that has a story about where you learn to cook, who you cook for, why you cook, what you cook, all of that good stuff. Not necessarily what you feel like you need to cook in order to keep your Austin card. And so we got recipes from all over the world because people move from all over and they live all over and they come and they, those food traditions stay with them as they come together. But as a feminist, this is what really stuck, you know, made me stick into this project and, and, and love it and become an advocate for community cookbooks. Because I was able to see that in the early days of community cookbooks, this was in, you know, around the Civil War, women were galvanizing in their communi community to raise money for veterans of the Civil War to pay for some of their, their health care costs. And then that continued into the 20th century where p women were, were raising money for schools and scholarships and churches. And you think about all the goodwill that these community groups fostered by monetizing something that previously hadn't been given very much value, and that is a recipe. And when you think about how women, it allowed women to engage in commerce in their communities, it allowed them to go to advertisers and, and publishers and, and work on contracts, and then they had to distribute those books, and, they, and then they were working on you know, the next volumes and next editions. You think about junior leagues, you know, the uh, Red River, the uh, River Road recipes from the Baton Rouge uh, Junior League is the biggest selling community cookbook of all time, and they've sold three million copies of that book. I mean, that has raised an enormous amount of money for that town. And that concept that you could sell an everyday average recipe was previously something that was unthought of. So that's the thing that I really like to make sure that we continue to talk about as we look at the value of a recipe today, which we can talk about if you guys are interested with food blogging and the proliferation of recipes. Um, but then also making sure that we don't lose the tradition because we're seeing ch churches, uh, you know, church membership is declining. The good old spiral community cookbooks, there aren't as many of them as there used to be. Um, I don't know how many of you have even participated in, at, in community cookbooks, maybe in, as a student or as a member of a church. But Marvin, what were you going to say? Well, I did want to make one comment about community cookbooks. M most of my work is about uh, eh, South Central Texas around the 1880s, 1890s, and I'm, I'm typically looking at uh, uh, minority groups who may, may or may not have been minorities at the time, but that we view to as minority today, um, moving in and out of these places, usually with the railroad. Um, and <clears throat> I've looked at community cookbooks many times. And one thing you do need to keep in mind is what, what, that commu what it means by community cookbook, because typically we take a community cookbook and we look at a, a town as, you know, this is, this is uh, reminiscent or, or reflective of that town, right? It's not usually the case because there are people who, whose voices are not in that book um, that lived in that town, and, and usually whole communities. Um, and, and most of the time it, it would be 
non-English speaking communities, non-Anglo speaking, non-Anglo communities that uh, um, are the subject of some of the work I do on my dissertation, but you don't find that. And so you gotta, you gotta be careful with community cookbooks. There's so much you can get th from them like you had mentioned, but some, there's a lot that's not there that if you look at it, you can figure out things about the community um, and the ways that maybe communities in, in, in that town where there were friction or not, or, or who's not there and who's, the right. Yeah. One other thing about community cookbooks, some of them were produced to show how cultured and literary the community was, or is. Um, there's the first Houston cookbook. There's a recipe in there that talks about uh, cooking a chicken and s starts out by saying, well, when you're sailing in Chesapeake Bay, it's easy. <laughs> well, Why, yes, of course, we all do that. <laughs> Uh, just to amplify that a little bit, I think when you're looking at community cookbooks, you also need to remember that um, a lot of times people submitted recipes that they just took from a national cookbook somewhere, uh, and they're, you know, not necessarily reflective of what people were eating all the time um, in that town. The other thing is people tended to submit their party pieces. If you look at community cookbooks, there's always a lot of desserts and there's often a lot of appetizers. And somehow in small town, especially Texas, I don't think people were eating a lot of appetizers, but, uh, <laughs> but people, I mean, People did not so much submit their everyday recipes because people didn't need recipes for those. They knew how to cook those. So they wanted to impress people with their recipes and they wanted to show off a little bit these, you know, beautiful, interesting cakes they made or other kinds of desserts or appetizers. I think aspirational cooking is certainly uh, a big part of, of cookbook culture today. And you think about the trophy cookbooks is what I like to call them, uh, the Thomas Keller books or, or even in the Uchi cookbook from Austin. People aren't buying those to actually cook from. I mean, there are, there's a small section of the population that is, but it's a souvenir from an experience or it's a, um, a memory that they want to put on their, their bookshelf and, and look at and, and remember fondly. But um, what other... Tell me about the differences between community cookbooks and traditional cookbooks as it pertains to what people are actually cooking, the recipes they actually need, versus the recipes that they would maybe one day like to make, or at least kind of always have in their back pocket just in case. This is to anybody. I mean, <laughs> I mean, just like when you're putting together your cookbooks, Lisa, are you thinking, tell me how you're envisioning a cook using your book? or books, and, and, and also one of yours is more of a family community cookbook style inspired and the other one is a more traditional. How do I, how I envision, well I hope people use my cookbook in the kitchen. But every day, <laughs> or for parties, um, or on the weekends? Yeah, well that's an interesting question because I, I was talking to my editor and, and I, I view my food as everyday food more or less because I'm not really that fancy. I mean I do, in my cooking I do call for a lot of ingredients and things like that, but at the same time, I mean I'm not doing the turtle soup party food that you find and, you know, so, you know, the, the, some of the, I mean, I was looking at some community cookbooks today and I know, I mean, just some of the stuff, you're like, they were not cooking that in El Paso, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so, I mean, I view my recipes as, I mean, it, it is very accessible, but, I mean, as you said, there are some cookbook authors out there who are a little bit more aspirational. Mm -hmm. so. Well, tell me about, like, Helen Corbin, uh, famed Texas cookbook author, that was one of, who made your list of the, oh, yes. the cookbooks that every Texan needs. You know, what were the kinds of dishes that she was creating for her ideal reader? Well, Helen Corbett was a big influence in my mother's circle in Fort Worth. Um, it was just fun to go to her restaurant, to have lunch, and then to try to recreate one or two of the dishes for a party. It wasn't everyday food, but you aspired to that. You tried to make something like, she, like Helen Corbett would make, mm -hmm. but she was just, just a big influence of, this was cultured, wonderful food. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how, how has food blogging changed our perception of everyday eating and everyday cooking? Oh, oh I would love to hear all day about Helen. <laughs> Helen's one of my favorites too. Um, does everybody here know who Give Helen a, I Corbett want you to is. talk about her for a minute. Uh, she, wa she was, um, 
I don't know, she's probably the person that first put Texas cooking on the map in the larger world. And she was from New York, but she came to Texas and she started out as a food economist or something like that. But she, she, um, she worked at a, mainly at um, country clubs and then um, restaurants and department stores, including Neiman Marcus. And she wrote a handful of cookbooks that were some wildly popular. But she really was one of the first people to take elements of traditional Texas cooking and elevate them into more finer cuisine. Like, for example, I think she was the one who invented Texas caviar with black-eyed peas. Um, maybe that's it. Oh, oh yeah? That's good to know. Okay. Well, she gave it the name anyway. She, um, she, Texas caviar. There you go. And that's it. And right. Show what she's about. There right. will be a quiz. So take notes. <laughs> and I was in San Francisco a few weeks ago and got taken to the rotunda at Neiman Marcus there for lunch. And guess what they were serving? They were serving Helen Corbett's chicken salad. They were serving popovers with strawberry butter. And I believe they had her um, cheddar cheese soup on the menu too. So we're across the country in San Francisco and Helen Corbett's recipes are alive and kicking. Wow. And the, you know, her, her cookbooks are wonderful. The, the recipes work. They're still delicious and people like them. Who are some of the other iconic figures in Texas food that you want our audience to walk away with a little bit more familiarity with? This is to everyone. Anyone else? I have an idea, but somebody else should talk. Um, I'm also a big fan of, of um, Mary Falk Cook in Austin, who uh, came from an old Texas family and ran the Green Pastures restaurant in Austin for many years, and also wrote a couple of cookbooks. And she, this, she was, this was in the mid-60s mainly, but she knew everybody all over the state and entertained most of them. And her cookbooks have great recipes, but they also have great stories about people that she knew, where she got the recipes, a party she went to in Fort Worth, El Paso, whatever, um, and she knew politicians and had stories about what LBJ liked to eat and what various senators were interested in. So um, it, it's, her books are, one in particular is, is a, it's called, just called the Texas Cookbook. But it's got great recipes and great stories. That's my favorite book. One of my favorite. I, mean, you can just, I mean, it's just this travelogue across the state, and she is just this outgoing woman, and she knew everybody. And you know, she just, you know, she'd be hanging out with them, and she'd like, give me that recipe and put it in this book. And it, you don't, it, I read it all the time. I love that. The nice thing is, she attributed the recipes. Every, yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she took. She, she tells you where she got. Well, that's them. what makes them so interesting. Mm -hmm. Beth, who are some of your favorite authors from your collection? Who do you seek out? Well, let's see. Helen Corbett. I mean, I've got the whole collection, the, all of everything. <laughs> and I, I guess the other things I cook just come from more um, American cookbooks than just the straight Texas ones. Since I was collecting cookbooks, even my mother who lives with me knows, OK, those don't go in the kitchen. These we can take in the kitchen and cook from. <laughs> so um, Linda West Eckhart, who did the Only Texas Cookbook, that's a favorite. I have two copies. <laughs> One's a kitchen copy. <laughs> uh, Marvin, does anybody come to mind? Any pioneers even in your space? No. Um, <laughs> so uh, we do cook at my house, um, but uh, it comes from a collection of recipes that have just been pulled from everywhere. Some of them from cookbooks, but a lot of them from my mother-in-law or my father's family um, who passed down some. And that's where they typically come from. So I think the two cookbooks that I use the most, this is going to sound probably pretty terrible, but um, the one that I find the most useful is uh, How to Cook Everything, <laughs> which actually explains how to do certain yeah. things, right? And the other one that I'm a, I'm a hunter, I, I, it's something I obsess about every year 
and uh, a guy in Austin named Jesse Griffiths wrote a book uh, called A Field. And the best thing about that is his descriptions of how to do certain things and how to cook a specific thing a certain way. Um, and that's my, f I mean, a lot of cookbooks you can go through and you can read the ingredients and get the quick deal, but he's very thorough and this is how you clean the animal, which most people, you know, if you're hunting, you already know that, but uh, it's accessible and that's the type of stuff I enjoy. And yeah, they're pretty good too. His um, Dai Due restaurant just opened uh, in the past few months and it's definitely worth seeking out when you're in Austin. So I wanted to put a plug in. Uh, Rob Walsh, his, his name is on I think your bio list. He's written quite a few books about Texas history, Texas foodways. <clears throat> One of the uh, foremost experts in the field right now. Um, and I also wanted to give a plug to Julie Bunnell and some of the food writers who came before me in the newspaper industry. Um, I recently did a story for the Statesman about some of the pioneers, the, the women who held these positions for 20, 30, even 40 years. Uh, Dottie Griffith is here, who was the longtime food writer for the Dallas Morning News. And uh, her, one of her predecessors, her name was Julie Bunnell, she actually had a daily variety show that came on uh, around noon every single day, in addition to her job as the city's food writer. And so she was this iconic figure in, in Dallas um, during the 50s and 60s. And uh, you know, just that we take, it's important for us to recognize that food is not as well respected as an, an area as it always has, or as it is now. I mean, everybody always loved food, but it wasn't necessarily worthy of uh, serious study, um, you, you know, in, in the form of academic pursuit, or even from a newspaper's perspective. The Statesman didn't get a standalone food section until 1978. And that was, you know, 20, 30 years after some of the other newspapers in the city. So um, it's just when you start thinking about, you know, who, how are we doing the chronicling? How's, how are we telling the stories that we, you know, whose voices are we leaving out? It's important to think about that kind of stuff. Marvin, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to comment that the word foodways is relatively new as well. I mean, food history, food culture, those, be, that, those uh, I guess, disciplines, if you want to, you can't even really call them that. Um, those interests being studied in uh, academic departments, they probably don't go back more than 30 years, and it's picked up a lot of steam in just the last 10, probably. And why do you think that is? Is that, was that surprising to you? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't really interested in myself until around 2005, right? So that's 10 years ago. Um, and it's, I think, the movement towards oral history being accepted more in academia, which it wasn't for years. Um, if it wasn't on a piece of paper, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't evidence. Um, and you know, I, I can see where that would be an issue, you, just reading through some of the oral histories that we collect. Sometimes the dates are wrong, right, when they're talking, because you don't remember everything exactly um, as, as it happened. Um, but when you take a large swath of people talking about something similar, you can get a good general idea of what was happening um, in, say, for instance, we did a, <clears throat> a recent uh, project where we went into East Texas around Jasper and uh, interviewed folks just in their homes about um, subsistence farming. And these are people who didn't, they weren't farmers, they weren't uh, working in the food industry, they were just cooking what they were raising in their gardens um, and then what they could get from stores, because there were no, there's no HEB there wasn't back then, you know, or, or, or large grocery store. They were getting them from corner stores and things like that. So you get an idea of, you know, these 15 or so people that we have found in these communities. You get an idea of what was going on at a certain point of time. But uh, I think that acceptance is probably what's... Well, it was so that. obvious. It was just right under our noses. I know. I know. Um, I just wanted to add that I, I think the pop, the growing interest in food studies and food history is a direct offshoot of the growing interest in food and in general. I mean, 20 years ago, would any of us thought that chefs would be rock stars? Uh, no, we didn't. Then they are and they have been. And so I just think it's a natural progression that because we are paying more attention to food in different ways, that we're now starting to think about, well, where did all this come from? How did this happen? How did food move around the world? Um, uh, I, that's my two cents. Yeah, there, there's certainly, there's always, well, not always, there is a longer history of study, the study of food in terms of like archeological um, 
history, archaeological works, some anthropological works. Um, but moving into um, culture that is more theoretical than anything in, in, some, in some ways, that's, that is fairly new. And I think it does have a lot to do with interest in the food, where it comes from, the people who are actually cooking it or growing it. Um, yeah, and a lot, you know, Southern Foodways Alliance, I don't know if y'all, we're Foodways Texas, Southern Foodways Alliance is kind of our sister organization, um, and we grew out of them because so many of us that started Foodways Texas were members and interested, but they cut off, they cut off the South along I-35 and I-10, so we leave out a whole swath of, <laughs> of Texas, so that's why we exist now, but, but they, they, they became uh, an organization at the end of the 90s, and their, the impetus for that organization was um, a reconciliation between black and white around t a common table. That was their idea. Um, and I think for the most part, early on especially, they, they did a pretty good job of that. But uh, it was, it, again, it was, why are we eating this in the South? And uh, looking at it more closely, and that's, that stuff has come from that. Yeah, I'm really glad to see the celebration of home cooking that's happening. And I think, you know, do you guys think that we are, are celebrating it more than we have been? Or would you say, because I realized as I was saying that, that, you know, the Food Network isn't really showing very many educational food shows anymore, and that we are in some ways seeing a little bit of a decline in, you know, our, well, just the question is, are people cooking more than they used to, or are we just eating out more? Because at this obsession, obsession with chefs, does that mean that we're actually not cooking at home? Or when you go around the grocery store and you see, you know, the frozen food aisle take up so much space and all these convenience and helper foods, does that mean that we're not cooking anymore? So first, let me challenge my own assertion that I, that I think that we're cooking more and see what you guys think about that. I think we're cooking more. I yeah. think, um, I mean, I'm a blogger and, and I come from that culture, so maybe my view is biased, but I mean, bloggers have become successful and able to become bloggers because people are cooking more. Um, I think a lot of that stemmed from, you know, the recession and it was just out of, you know, economy. But I think people started when they did start cooking more to save money, they realized that they liked it and the food tastes better. Mm -hmm. And it's fun, and you know the whole going back to the community, swapping recipes, things like that. I mean, it's 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 a hobby, but it's a useful hobby because you have to eat. So um, that's I, I. It's interesting that I've seen actually more people, even in New York, where there's a huge restaurant culture, people cook, and you know you. Uh, it's yeah, I think people are cooking more. Yeah. So. Would anybody disagree? Not exactly, but, <laughs> but, but I do think that people, people, I think people are cooking more, but more as less daily cooking. I mean, if, if you think about how our grandmothers and their predecessors had no choice, they cooked three squares every day. Um, my own great grandmother had a boarding house and she made biscuits and cornbread for every meal three times a day for 20 people. Um, I, you can sort of see why the next generation kind of got away from that and convenience food had its place. But So I think now people are more back being more interested in food and its roots and going to farmers markets and getting fresh food. But it's almost like an entertainment in that we do it on weekends when we have time, when we can, I don't think people are cooking more every day. That, that's just my feeling. Um, it's a it's a tricky question, obviously. Um, a trick question. <laughs> it's a trick question. Yeah, I, I think that uh, when first off, you have to define what you mean by cooking, mm -hmm. um, and uh, also understand that it has a lot to do with income, access, um, your family history, right, and uh, I. I'll reserve answering this question at all until a, a woman at, at UT is doing a, a community study in East Austin. Her name is Nia Jones. And when she comes back with that, it's kind of like going out and interviewing people. When she comes back with that, I'll, I'll post something about it. And, and then I'll, I'll tell you what I think. But I, I think it's certainly in some circles, yes, people are cooking more, but maybe not in, in all. So. Right. Yeah, or just the, even the option you know, to even have this discussion is, is a really interesting place for us to be. Um, yeah, we do have a luxury to do that. And, and I think that it's important as you all think about this and as it pertains to your own lives and as it pertains to your careers and, and however many of you are interested in 
I, I would love to know some of the majors of some of the students who are in here and some of the careers of some of the people who are, whose student days are behind them. Uh, what brings them here? Because every one of us deals with food both on a personal level and some of us, if we're lucky, deals, deal with it on a professional level and to do so with a really wide perspective about the fact that not everybody eats the same way that we do, not everybody shops at the same place that we do, and not everybody has the same just general thought process about what is good food and what is not food, and that when we apply a label like that, it's, it's just, it gets real sticky real quick. Um, in my writing, I really try hard to not assume that, you know, farmer's markets are, are the highest and best place that people can spend their money, because I know that grocery stores do a pretty good job of sourcing. And I know that I spend a lot of my grocery dollars uh, at HEB, and I, I enjoy that because I get to feel like I'm a part of my neighborhood shopping experience, as opposed to going 20 miles out of the way and shopping, um, you know, and buying and having this great exchange with the farmer who grew my own food, but to know that that's not something that's necessarily available for everybody all the time. So now let's talk a little bit about Waco Foodways. Uh, I know John had said that uh, he thought that this is a, a budding food culture, and I think in some ways um, Waco has had a, 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 well, every place has had a long food culture. Maybe we just don't know as much about it, but um, Dr. Pepper is the first thing that comes to mind. What is it about Dr. Pepper that makes it so appealing both to Texans and then to people, to non-Texans? Is it the lack of the period at the end? Or is that only something that copy editors notice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, well, what I know is that about the same time all over the country, people were getting interested in bubbly medicinal waters, which come, uh, th th that history goes back to at least the Romans. Um, but there were, uh, you know, drugstores and soda fountains came out of the apothecary tradition, and, and these... Um, Drinks were originally for health purposes, and I believe that Dr. Pepper was too. Uh, but he was able to make it taste so good <laughs> that, I mean, what's not to love? Uh, At least I know uh, Dr. Pepper ribs is one of your fa famed recipes. Or well, I think for Texans, um, I mean, we have big we have big red and you know there's a little there's some smaller ones but Dr Pepper's you know probably the most iconic Texan identified soft drink and I know only until like the last 20 years it was really hard to find outside of the state and so you know there was just all these you know legends like uh, you know oh I understand they have you know Dr. Pepper two states away and people in New York would do road trips and you know things like that so when you can't get something of course it elevates it to even more mythic status but I mean you know back to Mary Margaret's point it's just a really great tasting soft drink um, there's that kind of unique spicy kick that like Coke and Pepsi don't have or you know and I, I it's just it tastes good and we always thought it was raisins growing up we, that, we thought <laughs> that was the secret ingredient to be does anybody know is that what the secret ingredient is prunes Oh yeah, so we grew up drinking Dr. Pepper. Yeah, in fact, I went on a soda hiatus one year in the very, and I lasted the whole year and the very first drink I had after it uh, was Dr. Pepper. And it, I won't say it ruined it for me, but I hadn't, hadn't had any caffeine for an entire year and I was just bouncing off the walls. And, and, then, and then I started getting the hiccups. Anytime I drink a carbonated beverage now, I get the hiccups. Um, so something that's newer is the Homestead Grist Mill. And Marvin, we were talking about this in the green, in the green room. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or I don't know that I'm the person. I've never been there myself. Well, I haven't I, been there either, but I, I just, just as an Austinite, you're familiar with Yeah, that. yeah. I mean, I, I, they make, was it Brazos Valley Cheese is the name? I mean, that, this stuff that they're doing there has made it statewide. Uh, the, the people in Houston are sourcing from them in restaurants even, um, and definitely Austin. I'm, and I would assume probably San Antonio as well. It's, yeah. And what I think is interesting is that they are uh, now a, an, a tourism destination where you can go and take classes and learn, about, learn uh, from fabric arts to canning and preserving and how the, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not just food. Um, and that's, that's unique for, uh, for any kind of place to have a specific place where you can go and learn and have hands-on a uh, hands-on experience with your food. And that's, I mean, that is such a hot topic these days. Every, every restaurant wants to have cooking classes and grocery stores want to have hands-on demos. And, you know, people really want to go out of their way to see how things are done. They do want to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> so, 
Um, let's see, how much time left do we have, John? Or when do you want me to take questions is really the question. Oh, that sounds good. Okay, let's talk about restaurant culture in the state. I know food trucks are something that has been a hot topic for the past five or six years in Austin. Um, and we've talked about southern food being popular. What are some other food trends that you're seeing, either in restaurants or food trailers? In, in trailers or restaurants or in I mean like today I was downtown and there was a place um, Kristen recommended to me and they had uh, bun mis and pho. Um, it used to be you could only find Vietnamese food pretty much in like the big cities, but I've noticed in in, in Houston here, but you know, and then at, you know sometimes in Austin and, and Dallas, but now you see it even in small towns. I mean, you see it everywhere, and you're starting to see fusion and things like that. I mean, that's what's you know the biggest thing I've seen. I think that's the most interesting thing, especially with Vietnamese food, is the fusion that's happening. Um, east of San Antonio, there, that you can get uh, uh, boiled crawfish, but Vietnamese style, they're starting to call it Viet Cajun. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it makes a lot of sense um, for some, some of that is, uh, well, Creole is really, I mean, there's, there are both of these, these uh, I guess styles are in East Texas and Western Louisiana, um, and uh, there's a lot of French influence in some of that. And it makes sense for the most of the Vietnamese population that came into Houston came in in the 70s after the Vietnam War as uh, refugees, and uh, there's their cooking is is influenced somewhat by French because they occupied Vietnam for so many years, right? So so it kind of they fit perfectly in there. So they're doing these these. Well, not crazy fusions, delicious fusions. Um, also, somebody recently saw a truck driving by that was advertising. It was in Houston. It was uh, Todd Romero, who's a, who's a professor at University of Houston, that was advertising um, some kind of Vietnamese tacos or tamales. So, and, so I've, I've, I haven't been able to try those out yet, but I imagine they're tasty. So. I mean, that is neat. When you eat a banh mi sandwich, you are eating uh, a little literal sandwich of history. And, right, because the, 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 that's where the bread co comes from. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I don't know about the state, but I know in Austin the fastest growing population is Asian. And so we're seeing a lot more um, different kinds of Asian food. Uh, Korean has gotten very popular. Um, Thai is very popular. And I think just as the demographics of the state changes, especially in the cities, you're going to see more um, variation and <coughs> home cooking from other places become just like, um, you know, ranch cooking and uh, southern cooking um, became part of our palate. I think these Asian flavors will too. And I just wanted to mention, one of my favorite places to eat in Austin is a hole-in-the-wall restaurant in a food court in an Asian market. It's called Kin and Comfort, and it is a mashup of Thai and Southern cooking. And it is so good. Uh, the, the Tom Kai shrimp and grits are one of the best things I've ever eaten. That sounds good. So, it's, it, it's worth a trip. Ken, K-I-N, and comfort. Right. It's in the Hannah World Market. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so food trucks, I was, because, you know, a, a place like Ken and Comfort is is open in a, you know, in a food court environment. Like a food truck, except it's yeah. <laughs> but what inside I, a building. I love about all these sort of, I we might call them non-traditional, even though you could find a long history of food cart. Uh, food carts in America, but that food trucks allow people with a vision to either start something really authentic that's niche in some way, or something that's totally crazy in fusion that no one has ever thought of, like a Vietnamese tamal truck, which would be outstanding. Um, but it allows them a foot in the door in a market to, to test things out and to see if there is an appetite for this, uh, you know, uh, Wasoda is um, an African trailer in Austin that it, so it's very regional and the guy who runs it you know he wasn't able to make it work for a standalone restaurant but it works for a trailer 
And, and so, you know, he has people who come from all over the city just to eat there, and he's only open a few hours a day, and that's what works for him. And because not, you know, a brick and mortar restaurant is not necessarily the end of the road for every person who wants to be a food entrepreneur. And I think that was one piece of the food truck trend that I, that I hope stays, is that people can use it to what, you know, use it for all kinds of purposes and in all kinds of places. I don't think we've quite seen food trucks get to the point where they are in smaller city, or you know, in my, my little hometown of Aurora, Missouri, population 7,000, does not have a, a food truck yet. <laughs> but I know that it's probably coming, because they're in Springfield, Missouri, which is, you know, the big city up the road. Marvin, what were you going to say? Well, are there any here? Yeah. yeah. Downtown. Um, I was just going to comment on the history a little bit, because, uh, well, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm loving the food truck trend, honestly, because it, it, it uh, offers a restaurant culture outside of restaurants, mm -hmm. um, which is something that has existed for a long time, but has not gotten any credit. Um, one, so, well, first off, probably one of the original food trucks that everybody would know about is uh, the chuck wagons, right? Mm -hmm. But the kind of idea of a mobile kitchen is not new. Um, and one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that I, I mean, it goes much further back than this, but um, the plazas in San Antonio around 1870s, at night, folks from what was called La, La Redito, which was west uh, of downtown, would come in and set up basically restaurants. Um, in, and, and they were called chili stands. This is where the chili queens come from, right? But really what it was was families coming in and setting up basically a bar-type table, and people sat around, they had real... Uh, plates, forks, they cooked right behind the table. It was a restaurant without walls or ceilings. Um, and uh, I think what uh, they, a lot of these places get short shrift in history because they, they aren't this kind of French cooking that was so popular in the, in the 1800s, that, especially in, in East, East Coast uh, cities like New York. Um, but we had a really robust restaurant culture in the South and in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, since we've been here, it's just different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I know that certainly reflects how I like to eat. I mean, white white cloth fine dining or fine dining is something that is a special occasion thing, and we get get so much attention in the media. Um, but I think most of us eat most of our meals out of our own kitchens, and then beyond that, it might be grab and go things from a grocery store or a, you know one of these the multitude of in between places that fall in the spectrum of restaurants. Um, can, we'll go ahead and start taking some questions. While I'm, well, I'm going to give a real quick plug. While we were talking about people, I wanted to make sure that you guys remembered as you left. Um, Zephyr Wright was LBJ's cook who went with the Johnson family to, to the White House. And I think that she does not get near enough credit for giving the world a taste of Texas cuisine. And, you know, even her, uh, you know, Lady Bird's chili recipe is really Zephyr's chili recipe. And I think any time that I write about in the Johnson family's food ways or traditions, I always make sure to loop her in because she was a big part of their family and, um, and you know, was influential even as you start thinking about the Civil Rights Act and, and, and helped LBJ get to a point where he could help that cause move forward. So Zephyr Wright, one of my favorites. Um, okay, so... This is a big question. What is the difference between Mexican food and Tex-Mex food? <laughs> Who gets to, oh. <laughs> I'll take this one um, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Uh, we, we do an annual symposium and this year, it was going to be, well, we've been, I, the biggest prob problem for me on this was trying to figure out what to call it, right? Um, are we just gonna talk about Tex-Mex? Um, we, we landed on uh, the Texas Mexican table um, and I'm from South Texas, so uh, I always called Tex-Mex what we ate in my hometown, you know, with friends, families, at gatherings, that's what Tex-Mex was for me, that's just because that's where it was. It wasn't what you ate in restaurants typically. Um, I didn't eat in a whole lot of restaurants growing up, so I didn't uh, really make that connection till later. A guy recently came out uh, with a cookbook, um, his name is Adon Madrano, and he kind of flipped this, the, the whole idea of Tex-Mex on its head for me. Um, he is arguing that uh, all of the, the elements of Tex-Mex 
that you see in restaurants today and even before have existed before Europeans ever got here. Um, and have been, some of these ingredients are what you find in South Texas or Central Texas or anywhere in the Southwest. Um, a lot, you know, cactus for, for one, um, oysters on the coast, those things like this, and there's a bunch of them. And, and he, he goes through and talks about this and, and connects it back much further than the original Tex-Mex restaurant, which was in San Antonio, at, well, that's what it was called, but in, at the, you know, end of the 19th century, right? Um, and is the earliest Tex-Mex is a very Anglo history. Um, it, of course, changed over time, and we, now we have these wonderful restaurants that have, fam have families have owned for 60, 70 years, like Joe T. Garcia's and Matt's El Rancho and, and uh, Mi Tierra in San Antonio. Um, it's different than what it was, and that's what he's arguing against, is the, that Tex-Mex was different when it started because you have people taking advantage of this idea and turning it into a restaurant. And, and the other thing that, uh, that people outside of Texas, um, can some, so many consider Tex-Mex what you get at Taco Bell. And, and uh, I'm, Cowbells. yeah, and, and uh, well, it is, right. And well, I'm not even sure of that, but about that either. But uh, you know, that's this idea of what Tex-Mex is worldwide is different than what we growing up in different parts of Texas, and we probably all have a different perception of that. Um, so There are two books on that subject, Taco USA and yes. Planet Taco, are two excellent looks at how Mexican food's uh, evolution and uh, how it spread throughout the world. It's really fascinating. Well, and the guy who wrote Taco USA will also be at the symposium, along with Don Medrano. And uh, I, I feel like this conversation is, is going to be pretty interesting, and it may get a little heated. I don't know. People, oh, yeah. people have... Oh, people yeah. There's them. a... Protecting. Gustavo will yeah. uh, talk about uh, Taco Bell in a yeah. really passionate way. <laughs> um, in a good way. I mean, I think he will be a defender. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that I think part of it is a question of terminology. Um, the term Tex-Mex wasn't used at all pretty much before the 70s. Um, I, when I was growing up, and probably when a lot of you, we just called it Mexican food. Um, it, the food didn't change, but the name did. So uh, I think a lot of times the confusion between Mexican food and Tex-Mex is really just a terminology issue. So we had a couple of questions from some very savvy audience members about the influence of food blogs on cookbook sales and just how food blogs are changing how we are chronicling our own stories and the, those of the people around us of, of, our, own, of our food culture. So maybe Lisa can talk about it from a practical day-to-day -day standpoint, and then Mar maybe Marvin can talk about it from a historian's perspective. So wait, what's the question again? Just how, how, how food blogs, oh. the proliferation, proliferation of food blogs affected cookbooks? Well, I think it's just a media thing. Um, people have a relationship with food bloggers. You know, you write comments, and, and I feel like, you know, they're out there and they're publishing recipes, and they have large audiences, so publishers want to tap into that. So that's why there's a proliferation, pretty much, of cookbooks, I think. Yeah, Oh, that's a long discussion, and, and some people say yes, and some people say no. Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people still like the physical physicality of taking a book in the kitchen because um, they don't want to get their iPad or their computer messed up with like flour and sauces and things like that. So, um, and it was interesting. I mean, from a personal perspective, when I wrote my cookbooks, I tried to do like 90% new stuff, and I would receive email, you know, because there was a blog, and people would email me, and they'd be like, "Well, why isn't this?" in the book and I'm like because it's online and they're like no we want it in the book too so I think a lot of cooks still embrace the print medium even if they read their fiction on their Kindle so that's what I'm seeing and and there's still publishers are still throwing a lot of money to cookbooks that they're not necessarily throwing into other genres so I think at the moment there still is a demand for print uh, I, we're covering cookbooks now more than we ever have in the paper, and I'm getting more of them on my desk than I think we've ever received. But from a, from your perspective, Mar Marvin, can we? Are you excited about the fact that everybody's keeping a not everybody, but there are so many uh, uh, food diaries that are searchable and? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add to this, but I will say in this. 50 years you will. Yes. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I think that uh, 
if food blogs didn't exist, we'd be in sort of this weird kind of recipe desert of just every, every piece of sand is a new recipe that you can just search on the internet. So the, the blogs kind of catalog stuff, right? Um, and uh, yes, it can be archived, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing at, uh, at the, we archive everything we do at Center for American History. One of the things that we're gonna start doing is archiving Twitter feeds, right? So these types of things that you can save, I think that the food blogs, that, that, that they're really, I think it's important that they're doing that because they're creating order out of disorder uh, in the internet. So what um, Elizabeth White is doing now with cookbooks and what the Texas collection is doing with cookbooks, in 50 years someone is gonna be doing it with what we tweet about food. How <laughs> interesting is that? Don't doubt that for a minute. I mean, I get really excited when I think about the fact that there are so many food writers that exist now. Because it used to, there were all these barriers of entry. In order to be a food writer, you had to have a journalism degree or have a culinary degree or a home ec degree and have access to an editor and live in a city that had a paper or a magazine. And now you can live anywhere and you can write about anything. And that doesn't just have to be about food. And I think that's really empowering from uh, from being a writer or just being a storyteller or, or being somebody who wants to document, even if you just want to document what you're making for your family so that you can share it with family who don't, don't live in your state or in your city. Um, I just think that that's a really powerful tool of connection and that's what we're all seeking. You know, people have a lot of negative things to say about how the internet is making it, making us detached and, and less social and, and I think that I, I think that we would all agree that maybe that, that that's not the case. I mean, I met Lisa through her blog years ago, and um, now I get to see her at least a couple times a year. And and even if and I, there are people I've met on Twitter alone who I would let watch my children because, <laughs> I you know you just develop this trust and camaraderie with them that was inconceivable to me when in 2008 when I thought that Twitter was for nothing more than uh, sharing what you had for breakfast. <laughs> So, um, Beth, somebody asked you about the oldest Texas cookbook in your collection, or, or can you answer in your collection and maybe in that you're aware of? The oldest Texas cookbook is the Houston cookbook from 1883. That's the sort of described as the first Texas cookbook. Um, but there was something else um, asked. The, what the. Oh, why are you uh, um, there was also a small recipe booklet by Gail Borden from Borden Milk Company from 1855. So I kind of accept that because he does have recipes, but it was always recipes for his meat biscuits, which I understand were just awful, but, um, <laughs> but, they, but they did have recipes, and it was from Galveston, so I counted that. John, how many more questions can we do? One more, this is so hard. Um, okay, this question I think might encompass maybe all of us. Um, can you talk about the differences between a written recipe and one that is passed down orally? Or it, maybe there aren't any differences, but are there values that are different from when we learn something and there's, maybe you, you, there's not even a recipe that you learn. You're just standing by your grandmother's elbow and, and watching her make something versus a print recipe that has some more traceable information. So the difference between something passed down orally mm -hmm. and something written down. Um, improvisation is probably the main, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't improvise with the written, but uh, if, if it's word of mouth passed down over generations, things change. Um, you remember things differently. And uh, I think the most important thing about that is you also have that connection personally to your past um, and to your family's past. And I think that is maybe more important even. Um, as long as you keep, keep remembering <laughs> the recipe and pass it down to the next person. So. It just seems to me like the major difference is there's only so many people that can pass down a recipe to you orally. Um, written recipes can open up a whole many worlds of food and other people's food traditions, which is not to say that I think the connection between each of us and the recipes that we get through our family, I think that's one of the most important things there is. But it is just your one family. 
Guys, I think we're going to have to end there, but I know that all of our panelists will be happy to answer more questions from you over in the reception area following today's uh, event. So thank you so much. Please help uh, me give a warm welcome and thank you. Now, what I want you to know is all of our panelists came here and they didn't ask for an honorarium. They came here because they love food and they wanted to be here with you, the audience. So I ask a dear friend, and uh, who's also the ceramist in residence, Paul McCoy, if he had a few things that he could share with us. So what I'm going to do is, they look like pizza boxes, and they're not. And so what they're going to do is decide who gets what, but you don't know what's in the box. So Paul McCoy does absolutely stunning work, and you can use his uh, pottery to serve with. It can be heated, and uh, Anne, you're here, right? Anne, Anne McCoy, has, did Paul make it or not? Okay, so, but I mean, is he here in the audience? He was going to try to make it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this, and I'd like you to open it for the audience. Then afterwards, everyone is invited back to the Texas Collection. There is a reception. The Culinary Arts Program at TSTC has prepared their favorite recipes, there are cookbooks for you to purchase, and they will sign them, and you can ask them all the questions that you didn't get answered here. So, um, hold on just a minute. There's also a hashtag, because there's always a hashtag, and it's uh, hashtag cooking in Texas, and I know most of us are on Twitter. Are you on Twitter? No, I'm Maybe. not. Maybe. <laughs> I can do that if you'd like to later. Um, and so keep those questions coming on there too. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about social media is that conversation can continue. Those are huge. It's pottery roulette. My kid watches unboxing videos on YouTube. That's exactly what this is.